I used to spend a lot of time reading. I don't know if that surprises you. Quite enjoy reading. Fiction, non-fiction. But um, ever since, like, as you go through life stages, I, I don't know if this is concerning to you, but you're like, man, year 12, I feel like I've got no time for anything. Like, year 11 was so cruisy. What was I worried about in year 10? I've got news for you. That sensation of, oh, in the past was nothing. Now life is, you know, cramped and lots of stuff. That, that keeps going. So you get to university and you're like, my life is so full. What was I worrying about in year 12? And then, and then you get to uh, full-time work and you're like, what were those lazy uni university students worrying about? And then you have children. You're like, what are those childless people worrying you know, about? Anyway. So, so I don't read so much as I used to. Um, so I listen to a lot of podcasts and audiobooks, which are kind of the, the time poor uh, person's version of reading um, and my favorite podcast it always starts it's um each p podcast starts with what they call follow-up which is you know what what's left over from um, unresolved issues from last time good morning boys come in take a seat so I'm gonna start with follow-up today and there are two questions that we sort of raised yesterday which um, were not entirely resolved so we're gonna, we're gonna sort of address them and then get on to calculus okay now the first question actually, some of you asked it to me, a small number of you asked it to me, and I answered it, but I realized on reflection later that the sort of, the answer I gave would be useful to more than the five or six people who heard the answer, okay? So I'm going to recite it for the rest of you and those of you who actually did hear it yesterday. You can just sit back and relax. Now, remind me, if you could describe this, this graph, right, which is what we spent our time on yesterday, if you could describe it in words, how would you describe it? How would you uh, express the kind of shape and behavior that it exhibits? It's an odd function. Good. So we've got some symmetry there. Okay. But I don't know what kind of shape to reflect, so I don't know what to draw yet. How else can we describe it? It's very similar to some of the shapes you already know. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's linear, kind of. It's kind of linear. It's made up of straight lines, okay? What kinds of, where do the straight lines go? Like, do they go up and down or across, or how would you describe them? I think, I think we said it's periodic, right? It's very similar to what regular sign looks like if you turned it into a linear function, right? So that's why you get this kind of shape. And it goes this way because, as we said, it's an odd function, okay? Now, one of the questions that um, someone very astutely asked was, oh, hold on a second, sine inverse, sine inverse, just taken on its own, sine inverse has a restricted domain. Okay, it only exists for certain values of x and it doesn't exist for lots of values of x, right? So how is it that if this thing is restricted, this thing, the whole thing is not restricted because as you see, it goes forever, okay? How does that work? Apart from just plugging in values, um, which will get, which will show that to you, right? Um, how can we analyze this and work out what's going on? Okay, so here's an illustration for you to try and help you understand why this thing exists for all your values, but while this does not. Okay, let's go back to what we understood about functions, right? I said a function is all about taking inputs, right? And then we define the function as some kind of rule, right? Which will tell you what to do with those inputs in some reliable way. Okay. Good morning. And then it spits out an output, yeah? That's what we mean by a function, okay? Now to add on to that and try and extend the metaphor, right? Domain and range. Domain and range, which we've been talking about all this time, restrictions, that kind of thing. Where would they fit on this diagram? How do they change? Uh, or give us more information about this, what this diagram is telling us, right? Well, domain and range, which one corresponds to outputs and which one corresponds to inputs? Range is outputs, right? So these are kind of like y values, and these are kind of like x values, right? So therefore, you've got your domain affecting your inputs and your range affecting your outputs. Okay, now let's be a little more specific. What does the domain tell you about the inputs? What kind of information is it providing to you that, that we didn't have before if we understand what domain is? Hmm. Now, in terms of like a graph, right, you'd say domain 
is all of the x values where the function exists. Right? That's a reasonable definition. Domain is where the function exists, where I can draw it. Okay, where you can stick a value into your calculator and get something meaningful out. Okay? But another way of thinking about it is domain is the kinds of inputs, right? The kinds of inputs that this function will accept. Can I say it again? It's very important. Domain is the kinds of inputs that a function's going to accept. Now we know lots and lots of different kinds of functions, right? Some functions are um, very broad and they'll take anything, right? So lots of the ways we start off, good morning, functions like this, right? Anything which is a polynomial, right? What are the domain of these? What, what, what was the original question? What x values do these functions exist for? Not a rhetorical question. All real values, right? In other words, their domain, right? The kinds of inputs they accept is they'll take anything. They'll take anything, okay? So I'm kind of viewing functions, right? A little bit like children. Now, children, I, I've got um, I've got a three-year-old right now who's right at this point, okay? Um, children can be very fussy eaters, and maybe you're like, I don't know, I'm still a fussy eater, right? Um, they don't want to eat certain foods. They'll only take particular kinds of foods, and if it doesn't meet those kinds of criteria, right, I only eat blue foods this week, then they won't touch it, okay? Now, on the other hand, you've got functions like this, children, uh, maybe you know some of these, who they're just like, you put anything in front of them, and if it's like, you know, even if it's not meant to be edible, they'll eat it. So, so my son who's nine months old, he'll just like crawl around the floor, and he'll be like, oh, you know, this looks, this looks like it fits in my hand, let's give it a go, right? So, not very fussy, right? So some functions, they eat everything. Their domain is all real values, okay? But some are fussy. Can you give me some examples of fussy functions? You can say the square root of x. That's not a polynomial, is it? Right? What will it eat? What's its domain? Give me something um, greater than or equal to zero, and I'll take it. If it's negative, Forget it, okay? I'm not touching that stuff with a 10 foot pole, okay? Give me another one, which is a fussy function. Um, log x, right? Almost the same domain, but it's a little more fussy, isn't it? It won't take zero, okay? And we've already noticed, this guy, now, how does he grade on the scale of fussiness? And the answer is, pretty fussy, right? What will he accept? Negative one, to one, and that's it, full stop. Very, very limited range, okay? So, that's what it's willing to assess, right? Now you can see what's going on here. I won't, I won't draw out the argument. These are the kinds of things which it will output, and it will only output certain things, right? Of course, you've got some functions which will output anything, right? All real values of y. Then you've got, again, you've got other functions, right? And they're a little more, well, they're fussy on the other end of things, right? What kinds of values will this put out? Greater than or equal to zero, right? Because that's the, that's the range of x squared. Okay, now, I think we have enough pieces now. We've established that if we make this sine inverse of x, if that's our function, right? We can only take some kinds of inputs, and correspondingly, it will only give you some kinds of outputs, specifically, between negative pi and two and pi and two. That's okay. So if it's fussy, that's a problem. That's why it's restricted. That's why it doesn't exist everywhere. So now can you see why is it that this thing, when we take this, this is not going to be fussy anymore? What has it done? Okay. Well, let's think about this now. That was sine inverse. Let's consider a different function. Sine, the inside function, right? Is sine a fussy eater? It's not, is it? It'll take anything, right? It's that, um, it's that garbage bin of your friend who's like, you know, these leftovers that no one wants to eat. I'll take it, you know, waste not, want not. So he'll take everything, right? Sine x exists for all real values. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. But what's the range of sine? It's from negative one to one. The range, the outputs, sorry, that's what I meant to write. The outputs are very specific. They're always, that's why, they're always in there. Always. 
Uh, that's why we talk about amplitude and that kind of thing, right? <coughs> so now, if I take this guy, right? The inputs that come in, and these are the outputs it produces. And if I put him over here, okay? Because that's what this is doing, right? You take a value, and when you stick it in your calculator, first you do sine, and then you do sine inverse of whatever you end up with, right? Well, he'll take anything. He's not fussy. He'll take it all, okay? But then what he gives are only between negative one and one, right? Which is exactly what sine inverse wants. It'll always give you something which sine inverse is willing to eat. So if you like, sine's kind of like, um, uh, he's a really good chef. You know those mystery box challenges and you're like in, in Master's Chef and you get all this random assortment. But he'll, he's so good, he can always come up with something that even a fussy eater will always eat. Does that kind of make sense? So something which usually will only take certain values, it suddenly now exists all the time because of what's happening here. All values, then it gets restricted on the range end. And then when this guy takes him, takes it, he's happy. Does that kind of make sense? So think about functions and what they're willing to eat and what they're what they're willing to produce. Okay? And that's how you get that's how you resolve mysteries like this.